I'm going to talk about uh, a reference atlas of gene activities and how we're using it. And I'm distinguishing uh, gene activity or defining it as, as the abundance of the active form of a gene product. So if the gene product was an enzyme, it'd be the, the abundance and the specific activity of that gene product. And we're using uh, protein abundance measured directly and, and level of phosphorylation measured directly as proxies for gene activity. Now, transcription and translation, of course, are separate in eukaryotes, and there's lots of regulatory systems that uncouple gene expression from gene activity. At the, so you'd, you'd really want to measure gene activity directly. But proteins are difficult to measure. So we've uh, decided to create a, a reference atlas of proteotypes for the organism we primarily work on, maize, so that others don't have to. And then we've begun uh, constructing uh, networks from them that I'll, I'll be talking about. And this work was really inspired by this paper published 12 years ago from John Yates' uh, group, comparing uh, RNA to protein uh, in yeast grown in minimal media versus rich media. And if uh, RNA could predict protein uh, abundance, all these data points would lie on the uh, diagonal line here. But you can see they don't tend to do that very well. And that, would, that means that it's very difficult to have confidence in inferences of protein uh, abundance from RNA abundance. So to make this atlas, we uh, sampled uh, all the major tissues of maize, including the seed, at several stages of development. We also, uh, uh, with collaborators, uh, have uh, characterized a number of uh, subcellular organelles. I won't have time to talk about that. This is just an overview of the data. Uh, the numbers refer to the uh, genes, not uh, uh, proteins or transcripts per se, but genes from which we uh, identify and measure proteins, phosphoproteins, or transcripts. And, and these are from 33 uh, tissues and developmental stages for the proteome. And then from the same ground tissue, uh, we have paired transcriptome analyses from, from a subset of 23 tissues. Now, uh, one of the reasons this is uh, valuable, particularly in plants, which have very large gene families, is that the activity of a gene, in this case it's enzyme activities, can be the sum of paralogs. And so you may know I've got an enzyme that transfers uh, or transforms one metabolite to another, but if you've got several uh, different f genes encoding that activity, it's, va it's valuable to know which one is actually active in a given tissue. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're looking at, uh, in, for oil accumulation in the seed, which occurs in the embryo, you can see over here, this is the key, uh, the embryo earlier and later stages, then germinating embryo, and then uh, endosperm through several stages, and finally the seed coat, the pericarp and aluron. And uh, so if you look over here, you can see at what stages are and how much are these uh, different paralogs expressed. And this allows you then to um, uh, interpret how the pathway is actually being controlled. Gene activity also, of course, can be regulated by post-translational modifications. And here I show where we've measured the abundance of protein during these different uh, stages of seed development. And phosphorylation, in, in these two cases, phosphorylation at the site is known to regulate these particular uh, proteins. So you can see uh, measuring protein alone, protein abundance, you wouldn't recognize that this particular protein is really only active at one uh, stage uh, late in endosperm development, and likewise over here. So these post-translational modifications are also important for measuring gene activity. And phosphorylation, of course, it, it can't be very effectively predicted from uh, protein abundance. And, uh, and here you can see uh, some of the seed proteins uh, that were measured both as phosphopeptides and non-modified peptides, and then clustered by level of phosphorylation. 
you can see that phosphorylation is highly developmentally regulated. Uh, and then the, these genes or proteins run all the way across here, showing uh, in this panel the level of abundance of the same proteins that are shown in their phosphorylated forms here. You can see that the, the level of abundance is not uh, highly uh, related to the level of phosphorylation. We took advantage of uh, this phosphorylation data and knowledge that phosphorylation of uh, the activation loop in kinases is a, can be a proxy for the level of activity of a kinase. And, and, and here we just show uh, a, a subset of these kinases where the level of phosphorylation is here and their abundance is over here. And using that, uh, we've asked what uh, uh, kinases have their activity uh, uh, modulating in parallel with the level of phosphorylation of potential substrates. And from that created a, a phosphorylation network, and this is a subset of it from the seed. Uh, and for internal uh, validation, uh, the, the set down here from this total of a little over 700 phosphoproteins uh, are highly overlapping for MAP kinase 6 uh, substrates from Arabidopsis. Now I want to talk uh, uh, now about the relationship between protein and, and messenger RNA. And this is a, uh, just a, a plot of our uh, RNA-seq data. These are the number of genes, excuse me, these are the uh, expression level of the genes, and then uh, on this axis is the number of genes with that expression level. And you can see there's essentially a bimodal distribution that was uh, first uh, noticed and reported by Sarah Teichman in the paper shown below, and then uh, followed up by a study by Matthias Mann on the proteome. Uh, and they found essentially what I'm showing here. This is data from maize, um, where the RNA and protein are from the same uh, extract. And what you can see in blue are the messages that we've uh, uh, identified protein for. And you can see that the, the, protein, the mRNAs that make protein are in this second uh, mode of RNA although there is a long tail here, so a small number of proteins are made uh, from these uh, low abundance messages. And uh, here uh, we've gone from a log 10 to a log uh, 2 scale, so it uh, shapes a little different, but, and we've smoothed it out. But what you can see is what I just showed you is the RNA, the protein coding part, and this is the phosphoprotein coding part. And the populations are really distinguished with an FPKM of one. Down here, we're looking at annotation versus the RNA data. The blues uh, annotated protein coding genes. Red are the annotated uh, uh, transposons. And then pseudogenes are spread across. Um, we heard from Sean Kepler about these dispensable maize genes and how they have a very uh, tissue-specific low expression, and that's true for, for all of the genes in this uh, other uh, lower abundance mode. And so when we, we're, we're trying to figure out, well, what, what's our coverage of the genome? And if we look at uh, the part that's encoding uh, proteins, of course, we get a different answer uh, for these two modes. So versus all of the genes from which one can measure RNA, we, can, we identify proteins from about a quarter of them. But if we consider this is the group that seems to be encoding the message, of this group, we, uh, we identify about 50%. So you can take your pick there. Now on the uh, correlation between RNA and proteins, that paper by Yates, they had a Spearman correlation of 0.45. Here we show both Spearman and Pearson. And you can see that for all these different tissues, uh, the correlate, global correlations between RNA and protein are bouncing around between 0.4 and 0.6, with pollen being an outlier with lower, uh, lower relationship. And to make this sort of graphic, I'll just show um, a set of genes for central carbon metabolism. Here they're clustered according to the messenger RNA, and now I'll just toggle back and forth between RNA levels and protein levels. So here's the proteins, 0.5, 
for the same genes in the same positions, RNAs. And you can see that you can kind of recognize some of these clusters here in the protein pattern, but not enough that I think you could feel confident in predicting uh, their protein values from the RNA values, uh, unless you had the data that, that validated it. Here's another way of viewing it. These are uh, rank abundance uh, values for messenger RNA and protein for a couple different tissues. Now you can see if you happen to be working with genes in this uh, region, you're going to have a good correlation between RNA and protein, and pr RNA measurements will be predictive. But we see lots of uh, messages, including ones on the axis here, that are extremely abundant from which no protein is detected. Likewise, we see a lot of proteins that are very abundant from which little or no mRNA is detected. And uh, the position of a gene on this plot in one tissue is very different in another tissue. So it's not a characteristic of the gene. It's, a, it's dependent on the context. We were quite curious about these cases of, of uh, high protein, no RNA. So we looked a little bit more into that for explanations. At least some of them can be explained by a transcript cycling um, and the protein being stable. And we just happened to sample at a time during the day when the message was down. And that can explain some of these. Another uh, explanation is that transcription and and uh, uh, translation are occurring at different times. And here's a case for the opaque 2 gene in the endosperm where we have high message levels but uh, very little protein early in development. Then the protein suddenly comes up even though the message level doesn't change much and, and phosphorylation occurs and then they go down. So this uh, time separation is another example that accounts for, for some of these. And then some can be accounted for by movement of protein. In this case, I'm showing an example where we have very high um, protein levels in the embryo, none in the endosperm, but very high message levels in the endosperm and none in the embryo. And so we haven't shown directly that these proteins are moving, but this is circumstantial evidence, for, at least for some of these cases, that proteins are, are moving into tissues where the genes are not expressed. And this shows uh, the number of proteins, genes making proteins, um, for which we can detect no messenger RNA across the different tissues. Now, uh, protein and mRNA correlations, uh, you know, I've shown you global numbers, but when you drill down to specific proteins or even on, ontological groups, and I don't know, you probably can't read this, it's certainly not legible on, on the screen here, but um, these are different ontologies, and, and one of the uh, takeaways from, from this list is that uh, primary, the, g the gene, uh, the RNA protein relationship for primary metabolism is very low correlation, but the relationship for secondary metabolism is a high correlation. And there are num lots of other uh, uh, cases where using this information, at least in maize, uh, under the conditions we grew our plants, there are thousands of genes now that are validated for uh, using mRNA as a proxy. But other than some of the ontological conclusions I've, I've given you, you wouldn't be able to predict which those are simply by their sequence or some other property. Now I want to turn to um, uh, network analysis. Uh, first, co-expression networks. Um, uh, we heard from Sue Ree about her exciting work uh, taking advantage of uh, co-expression networks. And we were curious, uh, does the relatively weak correlation between RNA and protein indicate that their patterns of co-expression would be the same or different? And you know, we were totally divided in the lab about what the answer might be. And so we felt we really had to go uh, test that. And when we uh, did the test, and these are WGCNA modules, we found, uh, the data's over here, we found in fact that uh, the edges have very little overlap. So, so a, a network made from the exact same sample using RNA abundance 
gives you a different network than using protein abundance. Now, we think these are complementary data sets, not conflicting uh, data sets. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, to me, this is a bit of a surprising result. So then we asked, well, what about regulatory networks? Um, even if the co-expression isn't uh, similar, perhaps the, uh, the transcriptional or, or regulatory relationships between transcription factors and their targets might be uh, highly uh, redundant between networks made, where in one case, we measure the transcription factor by its mRNA level, in the other, we measure it by its protein level or by its level of protein phosphorylation. And for all three networks, the identical target mRNA data set was used. So when we, uh, uh, yeah, and also I should mention, we only used the uh, mRNA targets uh, where the FPCAM was greater than one. And these networks were constructed with the Genie 3 uh, random forest algorithm. And once again, there was little overlap between, uh, in this case, uh, gene regulatory networks. And here you can see the overlap numbers. Uh, I can read them. I, I hope you can too. But the, the bottom line is here's the messenger RNA-based gene regulatory network protein, phosphoprotein. And uh, there's some, but, but relatively little overlap. So again, we think these are uh, complementary networks. And I, I, I should have left the slide in where we look at uh, known uh, regulators. And basically what we're finding is that in, in those cases, which are a very small number of these total edges, the, uh, the RNA network, for example, is finding different um, known uh, targets than the protein network. The other thing we're finding is that the RNA network has br better coverage. In other words, it'll find more real targets, but the targets are about twice as likely to be false as the ones from the protein network. And then we looked at the topology uh, shown here, and, and this is the three networks, the top 10,000 edges of the three networks combined. And the, the edges from the messenger RNA network are shown in red from the protein-based network in blue and then the phosphoprotein in yellow. And I think you can see that the connectivity is different between these networks with the highest with the phosphoprotein network. And you may know, but if you don't, I'll, I'll tell you that about half the proteins in plants and animals uh, that are phosphorylated are involved with transcription. It's an extraordinarily enriched group of proteins. Uh, and so having uh, this uh, phospho network be the most connected in retrospect, uh, I guess, isn't a big surprise. This quantifies uh, the connectivity that you saw there graphically. This is the phospho measuring the transcription factors as their phosphoproteins, uh, as their proteins, and as their messenger RNAs. And uh, I want to give you one uh, uh, data point, one illustration of in the information in these networks to just illustrate their use. And here uh, we're looking at these transcription factors uh, from the, the most highly connected ones from the phosphoprotein network. Uh, this, uh, again, you might not be able to read it, but this shows the overlap uh, in target uh, genes for e each of these transcription factors. And you can see there's a very high overlap, 60 to 80 percent of the targets are the same. And these targets are interesting. They, they're uh, most of the uh, light harvesting complex genes, uh, the, most of the plastid ribosomal genes, genes for tetraparole synthesis, all important uh, genes in plastid, chloroplast development. They also include a couple of uh, transcriptional regulators, G2 and GLK, which are important for uh, plastid development and development of, the, of C4. Uh, 
uh, in maize. And then uh, one, one of these, GLK-1, is, is a regulator in the RNA network, and its targets are a, a subset of the targets of these phospho uh, transcription factors. They're, they target the ribosomal proteins and tetraparole. So uh, we're now doing uh, direct functional uh, evaluations of these predictions to sort out uh, the hierarchy of relationships here. So in summary, the, the proteome profiling is, is providing us with a genome-wide view of gene activity and networks that, that we don't infer uh, from mRNA observations. Many of the most abundant proteins are not associated with uh, measurable levels of messenger RNA, at least with RNA-seq, and vice versa. Many of the most abundant messages have no detectable protein. A protein abundance is not correlated with phosphorylation, but both are regulated in a highly tissue and developmentally specific manner. The identification of activated kinases enable us to reconstruct uh, a kinase substrate network. I showed you uh, one of the subnetworks. And the relationships uh, identified by both co-expression uh, networks and by uh, regulatory networks those relationships depend upon whether you measure the gene products as proteins or messenger RNAs. And if you do both, you get complementary networks. And then uh, finally, the fossil protein regulatory network revealed putative uh, regulators of chloroplast development. Um, you can find uh, the, the seed portion of our uh, data at this website. It's also published, but it's very convenient to go to that website. And then, uh, the, the annotations of the genome are at May's GDB. Uh, finally, uh, I want to thank uh, some of the people involved in this. Justin Wally was a postdoc who uh, led a lot of this work, and he's uh, now a faculty member at Iowa State University. Joshin Shen's a chemist that's been with me for many years and uh, does most of the uh, mass spectrometry. Ryan's a graduate student who built out the networks I described, and uh, these others are assisting in, what, in parts of the project I didn't have time to talk about. The RNA-seq data was generated by Bob Schmitz while he was a postdoc with Joe Ecker at the Salk Institute. And Bob's now uh, on the faculty at the University of Georgia. And uh, these folks here all helped with uh, sample uh, preparation of the different tissues and stages of development or the organelles that I didn't have time to talk about. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Steve, would you bring uh, Asaf a mic? I have a question for you. The, if you think about setting aside the ones, the cases where the uh, mRNA abundance is dynamic, the, the, the diurnal cycles, for example, if I think about how much protein is going to be available from a steady state of mRNA, it's going to be a balance between the translation and then the degradation. Is there, are there signals in the mRNA that would, that would indicate whether it's a likely to be a highly translated mRNA? And then conversely, in the peptide, are there degradation signals that say, this is a protein that's going to be turning over rapidly? I, I'm sure there are. Have you looked, I guess? We, we haven't. I mean, this yeah. is a very small group. Uh, so we want to get the data out there so mm -hmm. people here and, and elsewhere that are interested in that can mine it, because it's, it's just a huge amount of information that should yield those kinds of signals, but we're, we're not able to go in and answer every question that we'd love to, cool. or else it, we wouldn't publish for five years. Okay. So I can't, can't answer that. Thanks. Asaf? Uh, yeah, maybe the same type of question. So these abundant proteins, but they don't have mRNA, they probably uh, degraded, yeah? So mRNA is degraded. Well, uh, I, that's a prediction, but we didn't <coughs> demonstrate that. But it should be, because how, how it's possible? No, it's logical. And why is this highly popular, uh, high number, what kind of proteins is abundant proteins which have no mRNA? Yeah, so if you think about the plot of, uh, um, that, that you're referring to here, we, we compared the 
uh, ontological categories uh, across the graph, and, and there was no distinction. So there's no particular kind of protein, size of protein, uh, pH, membrane, non-membrane. Uh, it's they're evenly distributed across here. So we there's nothing. Unfortunately, there's nothing about the gene itself that we could use to predict its position on these plots. You, it, they simply have to be empirically validated with our current knowledge. Now, maybe somebody in the room here can look at the data and find things that would be predictive, and that'd be incredibly powerful, but we haven't. Oh. So, hey, Steve. Um, hey. My question gets at this predictive power. So by integrating this type of information, you could see links between the phosphoproteome, the proteome, and transcription. And one example that comes to mind for me is actually the 1433 proteins that bind only the phosphorylated form of a particular and are particularly relevant in like primary metabolism and development. Have you looked specifically as that as a case study? So if those are expression driven, but they're only then binding to the phosphorylated form of a protein. So what would you look for? So you could look for um, a case where you had uncoupled regulation of um, the primary transcripts and the, the proteins, but you see phosphoproteins going up and then you see the four, specifically, I'd look at the 1433 gene expression correlating with the phosphoproteins. Oh, okay. No, we haven't done that, but you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more, have you done this question? <laughs> um, so, um, have you looked at antisense transcripts, and do you think the presence of antisense transcripts could be uncoupling uh, expression from protein? Uh, we haven't, and unfortunately, we don't. We also do not have microRNA uh, data. So I think that that's a, there are some obvious potential mechanisms that are well known that could be uncoupling. Th this issue has been pursued more aggressively in the animal uh, community, and there the argument is really around translation rates. But I think. Your prediction is certainly going to be true for a large number of cases, and and there's probably no one answer here that that'll explain everything. But I, I'm sure what you're suggesting will will be true for some cases. One last question in the back. Uh, one and a half questions, maybe. <laughs> um, the risk in this specific plot, right, is that this is reflecting technology bias as much as it is biology. Um, do you have a sense of what that may be? I mean, the, the sampling issues you have in trying to measure RNA and, and what you do in proteomics can be quite risky, especially proteomics has massive sampling issues and is technologically biased, we know for sure. How much of that do you think is in the mix here versus what's, what's really biology? Was that one and a half or was that one or a half? Oh, the, that, that was the one. Okay. <laughs> the half will follow. Well, the, it, it's a great question. and. Um, We've, we've tried to address it. For example, um, in this plot, this is a plot where RNA was measured as a microarray. And we confirmed this with RNA-seq. So to the extent you accept that as validating RNA. Uh, oh, and I should say, for maybe a dozen of uh, uh, these cases up here, we confirmed them with qPCR. That's mm -hmm. a small subset, but they can all confirmed, and this is all published. On the proteomics side, um, we've, uh, we do a, a different kind of proteomics where we can spike in uh, synthetic chemical standards of an exact known amount, and using that, we can get absolute quantitation uh, of proteins. And again, that's a small number, but when we do that, we, we confirm the results. So we think, we think that the general patterns are robust, although you could pick any particular one and it might be off a, a bit. And how this relates to the sort of network comparisons. I'm, in some ways, I'm not, I'm not really that surprised that from a shared edge perspective that you don't have as much, as much intersects. The 
topological comparisons, comparisons you showed, at least in, in that slide, were very global. Um, and all you could kind of see was really hub relationships. Have you looked at finer sort of network theory-based topological overlap comparisons rather than, than sort of connectivity as a measure to, to look for finer grained associations that there may be more structure there that's overlapping than you might think? We're, we're doing that now. Because obviously with a given network, you draw lines here and there. And um, we've been trying to optimize each network, uh, but that's an inexact science. And it isn't, we're just now going back and we're redoing the networks with lots of different parameters for each network to see right. uh, how uh, connectivity, the overlap between target groups, the precision recall, all, what's the dynamics of all of those things with the three different forms of network? Because uh, we're, we're naive at this and uh, it isn't clear yet what the correct version of a network is. You also might want to think, of, think about the metric space you're using. Well, we've, we've certainly seen that the metric you choose has a dramatic effect on the, on the resulting topology of the networks and have developed some sort of agglomerative approaches and ways to compare those topologies that might please, be useful. Please email me. <laughs> okay, we will do. Please, thank you. Okay, let's thank you. Thank, thanks, Steve, again.